from CNS and welcome to this new episode of NTB Dialogues, a special CNS series presenting insightful and thought-provoking interviews with leaders to accelerate progress towards their new This series underpins the urgency to step up the fight against the epidemic. 193 countries have promised to eliminate the by 2030 while India has promised to do so by 2025. Business as usual might fail to us in meeting the NTB strategy targets by 2030. The latest global TV report shows that the world is not on track to meet all the targets to NTB. New and fresh thinking is vital to reimagine every critical cog in the wheel to NTB as well as to accelerate progress towards other SDGs. Today's episode of NTB Dialogues features a very special guest, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist of the World Health Organization. She is a globally respected authority on tuberculosis and has been former Deputy Director General of WHO, former Director General of Indian Council of Medical Research too. Welcome, Soumya. And thanks for a lot for speaking with us today. So you were asking me about what we can do uh, basically to ensure that all those have latent TB do not progress to active TBs. Yes. I think the first big scientific challenge we have is that we do not know which of those people with latent TB is actually going to go on to develop active TB. Mm. So what all the different studies have shown so far is that it's usually a, just a small proportion, maybe 5% or so, who actually progress. So 90 to 95% of people, even though they're latently infected, their body's immune system is taking care of the infection. So what's been found is that people who got infected recently, whether it's young children or adolescents or adults, they tend to develop active disease within the first 12 to 24 months of infection. So that's when the risk is highest. And beyond that, they, even though they may show immunological signs of infection, like a positive ICRA test or a positive skin test, they're not necessarily at high risk of developing disease. So I think we will find it very hard to progress in this field because as you know, there are one and a half, two billion people with latent TB worldwide. It's not going to be practical to give them all prophylaxis. So unless we're able to find out by using some test, which of these people is at higher risk, then we can target that group for prevention, whether it's a vaccine or whether it is through chemotherapy. So I think there's an urgent need for the world scientific community to come together to try and figure out and there, are, there have been studies uh, on biomarkers, on gene signatures mm. to try to identify this small group of high-risk people. But we can also say that we know that young children, children under five, and people who have immunosuppression, like those with HIV infection or other forms of immunosuppression, are at very high risk of progression. So those groups, we need to target anyway. But it seems a bit probably excessive to target everyone with latent infection. So I would say that would put out a big call really for more research in this area. Okay. So for those who you, we want to target, say the children and the people with the, uh, immunosuppression, should they be tested and treated? Or... Is there any scientific rationale for not doing the test and treating in high burden countries? So here again, there's a question of science and there's a question of what is practical. If you really look at the science, then you would want to test people before you give them the, the preventive therapy regimen because we know that infection precedes the disease. You have to first be infected and then develop disease. But there are circumstances where this can happen quite quickly and the progression can be fairly rapid. So you can argue that in the case of young babies, for example, under 12 months of age, or people who are immunosuppressed who are in contact with TB, that you don't want to wait 
you want to make sure that you're preventing uh, uh, the infection from really going on to disease. The, the, the practical side, of course, is that there are very few affordable and reliable tests available currently to be used in low-income countries to test you know, millions of people to find out who's infected. So again, that brings us to another scientific challenge or an R&D challenge, and that is, can we develop an affordable and, and a sensitive and specific test for infection, which could then be used more broadly than uh, what we have now, which, which is actually uh, either in short supply or unaffordable. The skin tests are in short supply, the blood tests, the ICRAs are unaffordable for majority of countries. So, so I think an argument could be made in very high burden settings to, to test and uh, to treat without testing, but it will vary from context to context. So I think this decision making has to be done locally based on risks and benefits, which age groups, um, which other high risk groups to be targeted, um, how the follow up has to be done, uh, make sure that there is a good follow up because there, there, there is potential side effects for any medicine. So again, this has side effects. And, um, and also if we're doing it in implementation research mode, I think we can learn a lot from you know, studies in different uh, geographic and, uh, and other backgrounds to learn about uh, the strategy. So again, plenty of scope for innovation and research here on how to approach this. But I, I think one size does not fit all. Right. Uh, the current WHO recommended tests, uh, could you just spell them out? You spoke about the skin test and the IGRA test. What are their limitations? Uh, apart from being costly or not available, but uh, the results which they gave, are they sensitive enough? Well, the skin test, the, the um, the limitation has al always been that it's uh, not very specific, uh, especially in countries where BCG is used, that you could have a small effect of the BCG itself. Um, it's also not highly sensitive. And it, then that other issues like boosting and so on, if you do it repeatedly. The biggest practical challenge we face today is there's this global shortage of the material to be used for the skin test. Um, in terms of blood test uh, or the IGRA tests that look um, for the interferon gamma release from T cells is much more specific, though multiple studies have shown that you know, there's a non-concordance of 20% between skin test and the, and the IGRA test. But the IGRA test in, in general is more specific. It's in a way easier to do because you just do one blood draw and then you run the test in the lab but it does involve a blood draw, so it makes it a little bit challenging to be used very widely, especially in the field. And secondly, you need a lab to do the testing. And thirdly, there is the, the issue of the affordability uh, of this test and, and that limits the accessibility. There are new tests in development, new skin tests, which are based on the same antigens that's used in the in vitro IGRA test. And, um, and hopefully, if it is uh, developed by generic companies, then this can be also made more widely available. Uh, of course, we have to wait till this is manufactured uh, to GMP standards, and then you know it has to undergo some amount of testing and through the regulatory procedure. But I'm hopeful that we will have a, a skin test. But ideally, what we want is a biomarker, which will could be a blood or it could be from saliva or urine for that matter but a biomarker that really tells you who are the people at risk of uh, progression. We don't want to know just whether you're infected or not. What we really want to know is, are you going to progress? The current uh, preventive therapies which are available, uh, do they offer lifelong protection or uh, does TPT have to be repeated? Well, this is a good question. And again, it depends on the context. If you're living in an environment where you can be reinfected. Let's say you're living in an urban slum with very high rates of infection or some parts of the world which have very high rates of TB infection. Then 
or some tribal areas, for example, in India, the chances of you're getting reinfected are high and therefore the duration of protection of this TB chemo prevention will be limited. Now, with vaccines coming along, it's possible that you could have a vaccine that has a much longer effect. Uh, but I think we need more studies on whether you need repeated courses of chemo prevention or you need a different kind of regimen uh, and, and with the vaccines, whether they can be used as chemo as, as a protection and also um, to really show what is the ideal. So again, there's the evidence on this is patchy. And what about there being any risk of developing resistance to this uh, preventive treatment? I think that's been conclusively answered. Very, very low risk of developing resistance. Uh, because most of the time, you're supposed to rule out active infection by doing symptom screen, by doing an x-ray, before you put someone on preventive therapy. So I think we don't have to worry much about the risk of developing resistance um, as much as we need to worry about how you select people for okay. Okay. Uh, also is there a drug resistant strain of latent TB infection if a person infected with drug resistant TB transmits TB to another infected uninfected individual then would the drug resistant latent TB develop yes I mean if if the index case has drug resistant the infection to the other person will also be with drug resistant TB. So, as drug resistant TB goes up in a community, you'll get more and more latent TB infection also with drug resistant my, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that again is a challenge. Okay. Because it's not easy to detect or find out um, what the contact is infected with. Mm -hmm. And are there any special tests to? Uh, uh, diagnosed uh, drug resistant latent TB and to treat drug resistant latent TB? <clears throat> there are no tests to detect infection with drug resistant TB, no. It's the same test because basically you're looking at the immune uh, reaction and the immune reaction is uh, not different. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard at this point. So you only through history that you have to make a guess as to whether this person has uh, possibly drug resistant infection but it's very hard and if you live in a high tb burden uh, setting it's been shown uh, in studies from south africa for example that uh, there's a 50 percent chance that you can be infected with a drug resistant strain from your own contact maybe your parent or your grandparent in the house and a 50 percent chance that you pick up the infection outside your house from someone else and so you may have drug sensitivity. So maybe this is uh, what you've asked just now is another scientific challenge for us. Uh, you said uh, rightly just now that uh, there is a need for research and development of uh, new diagnostics, new drugs. Uh, but uh, are we using the existing to fight TB to the best of our ability? Are they being put to optimum use? While we recognize that new... Talk new about R&D for new tools. Yes. Always uh, have to uh, also preface it by saying using the existing tools better can achieve a lot. So I think we have not maximized the use of existing tools, whether it's molecular diagnostics, whether it's uh, the regimens for treatment, short course treatment, especially for MDR-TB now we have regimens which are shorter and safer and more effective mm -hmm. um, and then of course the preventive therapy for the contacts and the high-risk individuals so we have not really fully exploited the available tools and we must focus on that I think that should be our top priority for all TB programs do you think sometimes that uh, seeing global uh, the latest global TB report doesn't paint a very bright picture of uh, how we are uh, going to eliminate TB and are we on, and actually we are not on track. Is there a need to reimagine this whole TB care and control process? And can you please share your insights on this? 
uh, where are we failing or what needs to be done more or reimagined and redone or rethink we need on this? I think the first thing that should be done is to look at our data. I think data drive making. So we have a lot more data now than we did in the past. In India, you have the Nikshai, mm. and in many other countries, you have these uh, electronic reporting systems. Now, how exactly are we using that data? It could be used, for example, to see where there are where you're getting a huge number of cases, like a disproportionate number. Maybe it's coming from one particular urban slum or a low-income area in a country. Or you could even find that if you plot it on the map of the country that there are areas where there is hardly any report. That means that in that area something is going wrong. That the public private sector is not uh, really making a priority of reporting. So really using the data that's available to plot over the country, what's going on, where, what's the profile of people coming in. And then trying to figure out where things are going wrong. I think really we ought to need now partnerships between the public sector and the private sector and the civil societies because there's a lot more awareness created thanks to the government's commitment, thanks to you know a lot of very high level uh, commitments that are being made. There's awareness is there, but are the services adequate to meet the demand created by the higher awareness? Are we reaching? all people who need to be reached with appropriate diagnosis, with the correct uh, clinical care. So again, public sector and private sector both. So I think there needs to be a decentralized approach now where you go down not only to the district level, but below district level and in the urban areas to the ward level, analyze what is happening in every street, every community. First thing is to pay attention to data. So. Uh with the 50th Union World Conference on Lung Health just opening in a few days, two, three days, uh, what is your message for it uh, to help thinking in this conference and beyond? I think that we have to build on the political commitment that has already been made at the UN high level meeting. And we, we now really need to um, come together to address the gaps because the gaps are very clear when you look at the global tv report that's just come out you can see country by country particularly in the high burden countries where the gaps are where people are not being reached where there is less of uh, reporting where there is underfunding there's huge underfunding of tv programs and as the big global funders if, of course we're happy and lucky that the global fund has uh, been uh, completely given a mandate for the next three years going to vote. Um, but there are countries that are coming out of global uh, and other donor funding. Now those countries need to pick up the tab for TB. Otherwise, it's never going to, uh, we're never going to be able to uh, really solve it. And uh, then I think the focus on, uh, I would say research, not from a pure product development standpoint, but really from learning while doing implementation research and improve the delivery of their own programs and to introduce innovations which would really make the difference because I think local innovations to solve local problems uh, often have a big impact and so I think we should encourage a little bit out of the box thinking and try different approaches to see which one works better. Thank you very much Samia. Many thanks for being with us today, despite your busy, busy schedule. And um, once again, wish you a very happy Diwali. Um, and also thanks for throwing so much of light on something which, is, which we don't want to remain in the dark. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shobha. Best wishes for the union conference and happy Diwali to thank everyone in India. Thank you very much. Friends, you were listening to Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist at WHO, in this episode of NTP Dialogues, a special CNS series presenting insightful and thought-provoking interviews with leaders accelerate stress towards ending. We will share your comments and reflections 
on this NTP dialogue series at www.citizen-news.org. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode of this series.